Welcome back to Think Tech. Um, this is uh, Transitional Justice, and we have the honor of talking again to uh, uh, Gerard Gahima, uh, who is in Washington, but who is very familiar with the subject because he's, he's from the Sahel. And the Sahel is um, an area south of the uh, Sahara Desert and north of, uh, I guess, uh, equatorial Africa. And it's uh, actually in the larger scheme, it's not that thick a belt. It is a belt all the way from the east to the west uh, of Africa, and it seems to be in trouble all the way from the east to the west in Africa. And uh, transitional justice is working there because it just so happens that there's a lot of uh, failed states and violence, and, and of course, what follows violence is war crimes. So, Jared, uh, Gerard, tell, tell me what, what is going on in the Sahel that it should be this way? I mean, this is an area that maybe it used to be bigger, uh, but then the, then the Sahara dried up, <laughs> and and now it's a little smaller. And south of the Sahel, the Sahel is not great land, and south of the Sahel is a more lush tropical uh, region. So it's kind of squeezed between the Sahara and this lush tropical region, right? Um, and why is it that in this belt across Africa, across the widest part of Africa, we have so much trouble? Do you make a connection between, you know, the environment and the trouble? Many reasons. Um, climate change uh, is one of them in some places, like in Sudan, for example, some of the wars. Uh, some of the conflict is the result of struggles over resources, land and water, uh, struggles uh, fighting between people who want to farm the land and pastoralists who want to graze their camels and cows over the land. So scarce resources are driving conflict. Uh, but there are also external factors. Um, Sith. Before September 11th, uh, there's been a gradual increase of um, fundamentalist Islamic activity across the world. And uh, some of those Islamic groups, Islamist groups have established a presence in the Sahel. And they are taking over, they are trying to take over government and establish Islamic states. Uh, and lastly, um, the issues of governance too. Um, poverty, uh, sometimes driven by corruption, that uh, leaves many people feeling dispossessed. Uh, but then again, it's, it's, it's not um, a situation that is unique. Uh, to the Sahel, like even in this country in the U.S., um, there are a lot of people, pe poor people um, who feel left out, who feel marginalized, um, and there's also a similar problem in Europe, and that's why uh, some authoritarian rulers are coming up across the world by exploiting this uh, sentiment of at ease of dispossession among disadvantaged populations. So that is happening in Africa as well. So are there, uh, well, I'm sure there are, but what, what is the, um, the relative uh, contribution of uh, immigrants from the Sahel to Europe? Are a lot of people trying to leave the Sahel and get to Europe? A lot of people um, are living in Africa generally, um, especially in the countries that are poor and very poor and have suffered from conflict and going to, to Europe. So yes, there are a lot of people who are not living in the Sudan, but who are coming from south of the Sahel, going to Europe to seek greener pastures. And what about the, you mentioned that there was a, a fundamentalist 
um, factor here. And we have a number, we spoke before the show, about a number of, of coup events, uh, particularly in the, what, the western part of uh, Sahel. Uh, Niger, Mali, Chad, and uh, one and other Burkina one. Faso as well. And what? Burkina Faso. Yes, right, right in that same neighborhood. So, um, is that is is the is the uh, the common denominator people who want to create fundamentalist, you know, governments, uh, or is it just uh, people who seek military power? And do military coups. They're they're they're, they're basically Al Qaeda, ISIS type of organizations, mm -hmm. um, and it's not just Mali, Niger, Burkina Faso. It's happening right now as we speak in Sudan as well. Uh, these groups are active in Sudan, trying to establish a base and to do what they've done in other countries in this hell. Are they being led by some external group who, who coordinates them, uh, manages them, uh, outfits them, and uh, supports them with money? Uh, or is it all independent country by country? Um, I, I don't have any knowledge or an overall coordination and financing organizations. I think they, some of these groups, uh, they draw inspiration from ISIS and Al-Qaeda, but they're, they're not necessarily financed from a common fund or by a common government, one government or organization, no. So oh, how, what's the process of how they take over? I mean, take the case of Chad, uh, Mali, uh, Mali. Um, or Niger, those were military coups. Uh, how does the military coup um, connect up um, with the fundamentalists? Who is running the show? The fundamentalists or the, or the military people? In some countries, uh, like in Burkina Faso and in Mali, these military, these uh, Islamist groups have taken over parts of the country. And they're trying to govern the areas they control by Sharia law. Uh, in other countries, they've not captured, captured large territories as, as such. So the military, the coups, are really a response to the failures of the government to protect people from these Islamic groups. Mm. Because when the Islamic groups attack, they destroy schools, they destroy hospitals, so uh, they destroy livelihoods, and people feel angry and unhappy about the government's inability to protect them. And it's not just um, West Africa. We, we do have a similar problem in Somalia, for example. Uh, these groups have been active for a long time, and we've had a similar problem in Mozambique as well. Uh, on this coast of Africa. So um, I'm, I just wonder how, how it works. Um, uh, I remember reading that there are groups that oppose the fundamentalists, and they're kind of guerrillas, and they live in the mountains, and they come and they attack the fundamentalists in order to protect the villages and all that. And I wonder if they're successful at all, or that's a losing cause. Um, you know, it sounds to me like what happens is the fundamentalists come to town, and they do brutality, and they scare people, they put them in fear of their lives, they destroy the village, they maybe kill some people, they do war crime kinds of things on the people, and then the people succumb. And now it belongs to the fundamentalists, uh, whether it be Al-Qaeda or ISIS, whoever. Um, and now the now the, the fundamentalists own the town, and people follow their instructions. So it sounds to me like that's a question of taking power through violence, through fear, through you know physical kinetic domination with guns and bullets, and uh, to the extent there is a um, a counter uh, guerrilla offensive that tries to stop them 
uh, those guys are not all that successful. Am I right? You're right. Uh, they do a lot of those things. The, the bulk work, the protection people have are the enemies of those countries. And those armies have not been effective. Uh, part of the problem is corruption. If you look at a country like Nigeria, which is one of the biggest countries, one of the biggest economies in Africa, but they've not been able to defeat this Islamic movement that has been killing people and committing atrocities. And part of the problem is corruption. Uh, so generals are given money to fight wars and they sign one of the resources instead of using them for fighting those groups. So it's the armies that are supposed to protect people, but the people are, are not happy with the protection they've received. So, but nevertheless, at the end of the day, the military coup, the generals control the place. Do they, do they also control the fundamentalists? Or is no, there, they don't. They they don't. don't. They the don't. fundamentalists are in charge. In the areas they have captured, yes. Mm -hmm. Why do the fundamentalists do this? Do they do this for uh, economic reasons, for money, for resources, for gold, diamonds, what have you? Why do they do it? Or is it just for power? It's um, ideological. Uh, it's it's what they believe. They believe that um, their societies should be governed. These are the northern part in Nigeria. Nigeria is uh, has both Christians and Muslims, but the north of the country is Muslim. Niger, Burkina Faso, Mali. Uh, Benin, those are Muslim countries. So they believe that they, their countries should be uh, ruled according to the Quran and to a fundamentalist understanding of the Quran. So it's, it's basically philosophical, it's theological, it's uh, ideological, it's, it's, not, it's not just about power. But you know what? I, I keep hearing that um, that the Koran really doesn't support violence, that the Koran uh, doesn't support brutality, um, that the Koran, uh, you know, is that, that these guys have perverted the Koran and created their own Koran, their own kind of Koran, uh, and ordinary Muslim people, you know, don't necessarily agree with what they're doing. Am I right? Uh Again, this is like um, the question of Israel and Palestine. <laughs> it's another mind food. It's true. Uh, Muslims will tell you that the, the Quran is a very tolerant religion. Uh, but ask yourself, you know, it's possible to come to the U.S. tomorrow and build a mosque. How many majority Islamic countries would allow you to, to show up today and say, I want to learn to build a church? Two, uh, in most countries, um, it's, it's, it's possible for a Muslim to come to this country, open a newspaper, a radio station, a TV station, and that try to convert American citizens to become Muslims. And that would be fine with people uh, under our constitution. But in many Islamic countries, it's a crime that carries uh, capture punishment to try to convert a Muslim to become a Christian. So I don't think Islam promotes violence like we are seeing now in necessarily promotes violence of the kind we are seeing in the Sahel or in Israel and Palestine. But no, I, I don't think 
most Muslims are as tolerant of other religions as as they want us to believe. Mm. Okay, so let's let's look at these um, um, various coups. You know that there's been a fair amount of reporting that Prigozhin, remember him, the fellow who came down in that very interesting accident uh, uh, near Saint Petersburg, um, and uh, Putin. Um, want to have influence. Well, Prigozhin doesn't have any current aspirations right now, but but uh, um, uh, Putin wants to have a, a piece of Africa, and uh, Prigozhin helped him get a piece of Africa in terms of uh, gold, diamonds, other resources, um, and power. And um, th they were busy, the two of them were busy for some years in this very area that we're talking about, uh, achieving influence um, for Russia. Is there truth to that, and is it continuing? Yeah, the, the Wagner Group um, is still active today, even after uh, the leader's death. They're active in Sudan. They're active in the Central African Republic. And they are also present in the Sahel region. And... The, the activist groups that oppose uh, France in this region, uh, they kind of see um, Russia as an alternative to French uh, imperialism. So yes, uh, the Putin is tapping into our pre-existing resentment against uh, certain elements of the West. Well, P um, Prigozhin himself was a sort of a master of war crimes. And uh, then you get him, you get the fundamentalists, you get the, the military the cool people. You got three factors working in these countries in the Western Sahel, um, all of whom have a history of war crimes. Um, okay. what, what can we do about that? You know, one of the big questions I always ask comes to transitional justice is, so this is going on now. It hasn't stopped. It's not like we can we can say, oh, that's over now. So we could turn around, look back down the trail and and uh, investigate and find out who did what and try to bring closure to the victims, for the victims. But it's a different kettle of fish if the uh, war crimes are still going on as we speak. And there's every possibility, every prospect they will continue on into the future. So how can an organization dedicated to investigating war crimes operate and investigate in that environment? Um, I'll give an example of Sudan, for example. Um, there are many Sudanese uh, who want democracy. Actually, the majority of Sudanese want democracy. They want peace. They want the rule of law. So there are many among them who are actively committed to documenting human rights, to continuing to advocate for a transition to democracy. So the best thing is to support people in those countries who are already committed to this cause. And there are such groups. And I think that's the best thing to do, support local forces that are working for democratic change. Um, they can document the atrocities that are happening, but it's really not possible to have justice and accountability at this time. In this day and age, uh, when the fighting is going on, the important thing is to try to see how we can promote a return to peace. Uh, justice and accountability would have come much later. Like mm -hmm. in Sudan, for example, <clears throat> As we speak, we don't even have an effective central government. The, the army has kind of lost to the rebel group. Uh, in fact, they, they are thinking of relocating to Port Sudan and setting up a ramped government in Port Sudan. So there is no effective government in Sudan. So you, the courts are not working, the police forces are not working. So it's not possible to have justice uh, at all in this situation. 
you know, you hear about all these places in the world, including uh, some of those countries, the, the Baku countries in Western um, in Western uh, Sahel, some of whom uh, the Russians give them flags. Have you heard of this? They, the Russians give them flags, Russian flags, and everybody on the street is waving a Russian flag because it's, yes, I see it's, it's cute. It, it's cute. Um, but it doesn't solve any problems, and it doesn't create... Um, there's no way it's going to create a rule of law, democratic institutions. It's it's merely um, cute. But you know what? What troubles me is is the notion of failed state. And Sudan has every possibility of you know of hardening to a failed state. Uh, think think of Afghanistan. It's a failed state. It it, it cannot govern itself. It, it it cannot develop a bureaucracy. It cannot um, you know achieve representative government or the rule of law, it's just, it's all out of the, the mouth of a gun. And so some of these states uh, in um, uh, equatorial Africa, I guess uh, French equatorial Africa, um, are, you know, either on the brink of being a failed state, because a coup is closer to a failed state uh, than than a democratic government is. Uh, so my question to you is, at the end of the line, Gerard, when the state is failed, what is life like in a state that has failed, that is run by people who, with guns? Uh, what is life like for the individual citizen? Uh, but before we come to what is life like, let's look at the causes. So, for example, we talked about people waving Russian flags, how the Russians give people flags to wave. Uh, Let's not say Russia is the problem because Russia has not been in charge. The people who have been in charge are the French, exploiting these countries for decades. So the blame lies elsewhere, not with the Russians, the current situation, because the French have ruled, have controlled those former colonies with a tight fist, even after independence. You know, one country, Guinea, which chose not to be controlled by France at independence, when the French were leaving, they uprooted everything, even electrical poles. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, the rails of the railways, they, they pulled up everything before they left. So the, the French have been very very exploitative in uh, running these colonies. Another comment I would say um, about failed state, you know, there are places uh, that are failed state, and we see examples like Somalia or like Sudan now. Life is, um, is very bad because there is lawlessness, uh, people are not protected. Uh, government cannot provide services. Um, but I would hesitate to call Afghanistan a failed state. Uh, because the, for all the uh, human rights violations, they are more effective than the government, the American-supported government that they replaced. When I was, I spent a year in, in Afghanistan in 2015 and 2016. We were literally prisoners um, in our homes and offices. We could not travel to the provinces. Uh, so I think the, um, the Taliban have more effective control of the country than they're not, they're not Democrats, they abuse human rights violations. They are particularly abuse the rights of women and minorities. But I would rather have a, an effective fundamentalist, Islamic fundamentalist government than a failed state. We, I think we need to distinguish the two. Mm. Um, my question to you, Gerard, is, is, is that gonna work? Is there a model there? 
that can be helpful for failed states elsewhere? Um, the U.S. has been to Haiti before, and they were not successful. And um, I don't know. The U.N. has been in Congo for almost 20 years, and they have failed to restore peace to the Democratic Republic of Congo. So I'm not holding my breath that they will be more effective in um, in restoring order in Chad in in uh, in Haiti. But th th there are few success examples. Like for example, in Mozambique, in East Africa, there is um, the French had. Um, a 20 billion gas project in the country and Islamic groups took over the area where that project was based. So the French and the Mozambicans got the, gov the government of Rwanda to give them the military, their own military, to go and restore order. And they have actually done a good job of that. They've driven away the rebels and restored government authority over part of the country. So I hope that the Kenyans can do the same, can do for Haiti what Rwanda has done for Mozambique. Yeah, it seems to me there's there's a, there's a solution out there somewhere yeah. where you have a um, a country, a force that can, um, you know, control things and ultimately restore rule of rule of law to a place that that's failed. And I think we have to focus on that. I, I know that um, you know you're more interested in investigation of war crimes retrospectively and all that. But I think, you know, the UN and and the US for that matter should be focusing on systems and models that have been successful or that have the prospect of being successful. Because I think would you agree with this, that once you reach a certain point, it's very, very hard to recapture. Am I right? You are very right and the um There should be a, a, a multi-pronged approach. Um, combine intervention, like we are seeing in Haiti or in Mozambique, with preventive measures. Uh, for example, you know, you see all these people who are crossing the border ha coming from Latin America to the U.S. Clearly, that is unsustainable. So what the U.S. government ought to do in concert with the countries of, you know, of the southern hemisphere, should be to find ways of addressing the root causes that drive people to come, and sometimes the the causes are of our own making. For example, seven million people have left Venezuela, and many of them are ending up in the U.S. Part of the problem in Venezuela is that we. We have imposed sanctions on them and made life unbearable for them. So when you impose sanctions and drive people to have abject poverty, they have to leave the country. At the same time, we complain that they are ending up on our borders. So we need to think twice about the things that our government does. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. I agree with you 10,000%. Um, that you know, the first order of business is try to help those countries uh, restore the rule of law, help them become more palatable for the individual citizen, so everybody doesn't have to run away. And and that 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 is not limited to Latin America. It, it's also uh, you know a process that should be examined in in Africa um, and in, the, in the, the the global South. You were saying no, what? But our governments, they, you know, they, some of the things they do don't make sense. Like, agreed, granted, Maduro is di a dictator. If I was president of the U.S., I would help him to make Venezuela better so that Venezuelans can stay in their own country. So I don't have to deal with them at my border. But we still keep sanctions against Venezuela. 
can't allow them to sell their oil, you know? And we complain that Venezuelans are leaving to come to our country. And we're making it harder by imposing and continuing to impose sanctions. That's, that's like, uh, I don't know if you remember, but that's like in Hong Kong, where uh, Donald Trump imposed sanctions on Hong Kong when he was, he was trying to help Hong Kong, um, but instead he imposed sanctions on him. What, what good does that do? Anyway, I, we're, we're not even half finished without our discussion, Gerard. I really appreciate your, you know, taking the ride with me on all these questions. And I hope we can get back together again and look more at the Sahel, look more at these possibilities, because we live in, a, may I say, it, a, a degenerating world in many ways, and we have got to figure out solutions, um, not only solutions to prevent war crimes, but solutions to um, retain some reasonable civilized society, civil society, if you will. And uh, I'd like to compare notes with you on that going forward. Yeah, I look forward to and our thoughts are with the people in Israel. Yes, indeed. And Gerard Gahima, Project Expedite Justice. Thank you so much, Gerard. Israel and Palestine. Yes, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>